welcome, warmly welcome uh, Professor Nessie Alte from uh, the, the Department of Management and Entrepreneurship at the Driehaus College of Business, DePaul University. Uh, he holds a PhD in Operations Management from Texas and AM University. Uh, Professor Alte's research specializes uh, in humanitarian supply chains, uh, disruption management, and socially responsible operations. Uh, he's had a stellar career so far, and he's the first recipient of the American Logistics 8 Networks Academic Contributions Award. He's published over 30 uh, journal articles and co edited two books, namely Service Pass Management, Demand Forecasting, and Inventory Control. Uh, published in 2011, and Advances in Managing Humanitarian Operations, published in 2016, both by Spring. He currently serves as the co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of Humanitarian Logistics and Supply Chain Management and Senior Editor in Production and Operations Management. Uh, Professor Alte is also the current president of the Humanitarian Operations and Crisis Management Group within the Productions and Operations Management Society. Uh, in DePaul, uh, Professor Alte serves as the faculty director uh, of the Masters in Supply Chain Management program. Uh, he's just uh, been awarded the Fulbright Scholarship to visit Finland in 2021, and congratulations uh, you. for your award. And he'll be conducting their research in logistics within complex zones in Human uh, Logistic Institute, Humlog Institute, sorry. So, um, uh, today he is going to talk about the digitization of humanitarian supply chains, a rough review of research needs, and this will be a really interesting topic. So this is like a, a different type of uh, talk to what we've been uh, having so far. So I'm really excited to uh, see what uh, Professor Nessie's uh, research. Thank you, Isuru. Thank you. Well, first of all, thanks for coming here on a, on a Friday afternoon. Uh, you probably have better things to do, but I appreciate it. Um, I've been at the poll for, this is my 11th year. I uh, joined the poll in 2009, and as Isuru mentioned, my research is mainly on humanitarian supply chains. If you don't know what that means, I will explain that in a bit. Um, and also, the, I didn't exactly expect what to, uh, who the audience will be. I didn't, I didn't ex exactly know who the audience will be, so I... Uh, prepare the more softer, if you will, softer uh, presentation. So that you're not going to see any technical details. You're not going to see algorithms and stuff like that. Uh, be, this being the computing and digital media school. So this is very much a business school presentation. Um, I, I laugh at that because my undergrad is chemical engineering. So we used to always make fun of business school kids. Now that I'm there, you know, they're smart. Um, Okay, so the keyword here is rough because uh, this is not a um, full-blown literature review. Um, if, it, if this was a doctoral seminar, I would actually list all the literature that is of interest to you and all that stuff. But here I'm going to basically talk about what are the problems, and I'm uh, hoping to poke some of your creative genes and then make you think about what some problems that you can contribute uh, in humanitarian supply chains are. I mean, whether you're in business school or not, it doesn't matter. It's not a business school topic in general. Um, it's, a, it's a topic that applies to a wide range of um, uh, fields of study. So there you go. To give you a little background, why the heck a business school professor researches humanitarian stuff? Um, because it is personal for me. Um, that picture is from 1999, August 17th. Um, a 7.2 Richter scale earthquake um, shook Istanbul and, and uh, what we call Adapazarı. It's a suburb of Istanbul. And 17,000 people died uh, during that earthquake. And me and my fiance at the time, my, my wife now, we were actually getting married in Turkey at the time. Uh, she's also Turkish. Our families are in Istanbul. And we survived the earthquake. Our buildings, respective buildings, I was staying with my mother and she was staying with her mother, did not collapse. Uh, so we spent the rest of the week um, camping in a park. 
and waiting for the government to respond, which never happened. So at the time, we were both PhD students at Texas A&M. Uh, we, we still got married. Our, our wedding was uh, basically interesting. So no music, no dancing, no celebration, just a dinner and a signature. Uh, and we came back to Texas A&M. And at the time, she was the Turkish Student Association president. I was the treasurer uh, of the Turkish Student Association. So we did a big event, raised about $15,000 to send to Turkey. Um, and at the time, there was uh, one of the Turkish newspapers broke this news that the president uh, or at, you know, the executive director of the Turkish Red Crescent was building a summer mansion with all the donation monies. Um, so we, we didn't even know where to send the money, right? And a bunch of our friends from high school and college, they formed NGOs uh, to help different types of people, whether it's children or elderly and all that. So we divvy up the money between them, and then we send them the money. So all this exposed me to, number one, uh, as, a, as a victim, or as a survivor, rather, right? Uh, thank, thankfully, we were not victims. As a survivor of a, of a natural disaster, I didn't see the response that I, as I was expecting. You know, we all expect that if something bad happens, that the government will come and save us. They never showed up. Um, it took the Turkish government 72 hours, three days, to form an emergency operations center to decide what to do, right? And so as a PhD student, I'm a curious mind. I started reading about disaster management and earthquakes and all that stuff. And the first thing you read is the first 24 hours is critical. Within the first 24 hours, you have the biggest statistical chance of saving people under the rubble. If you wait more than, 70, uh, more than 24 hours, you basically practically killed them, right? That didn't sit well, well with me. You know, I was very angry at the time. Um, so I started actually researching this on the side, but you still have to finish your dissertation, which is a very um, um, uh, boring topic. Now, it was exciting at the time when I started. It's cross-decomposition algorithm for the coordinated joint replenishment problem. Right? It, it's a fancy name for a manufacturing scheduling problem. Uh, it was a mathematical challenge, fine, but um, created the algorithm, solved it, been there, done that. Now what? Right? So when I finished my dissertation, I basically threw away everything that I did um, and started researching disaster management. So I read about 3,000 papers. Uh, that's not an exaggerated number. I counted them. And, and made myself a disaster management expert. Uh, so I taught myself that, that stuff. Um, so I started my research with natural disasters, um, obviously focusing on earthquakes first, and then flooding, and volcano eruptions, whatever, uh, all kinds of natural disasters, and what happens to relief. So as an operations management person, I'm trained on process management and logistics. Um, so my approach to these are always from a process management and logistics perspective. I'm not researching people's psyche or psychology and all that stuff, right? Um, so I look at it as a process. And the process I was wondering about is how could relief move in this environment as fast as it can and as, as mo most efficiently way as it can uh, to help people. That was where I'm coming from. Um, so. Once you look at disasters, the next natural step is you start looking at humanitarian relief in other environments, which brings you to development aid. Development aid is there's no disaster. So basically a, um, a, a part of the world doesn't have access to education or doesn't have access to clean water, doesn't have access to roads. You know, you're, you're bringing aid to develop those things, to develop education, to, to uh, dig wells so that they have access to clean water and stuff like that. But that's still humanitarian aid. The only difference between disaster aid and development aid is disaster aid is, needs to be fast and furious. Development aid needs to be slow as molasses. Can you guess why? Why is slow important here? Hmm? quality. They both have good quality projects. The difference is here speed is important because if you're not fast, people die. Here, they're not necessarily dying, right? They don't have access to education, but they're not dying. 
faster is better than slower. Well, it, it, one thing I learned in the business school, mm -hmm. the right answer is always it depends. Right. So in, as an engineering student, you know, what has been taught to me was 2 plus 2 is 4, right? There is no other answer, in engineering at least. If, if there's an answer, your, your column collapsed or your bridge collapsed. So there's always one answer, 2 plus 2 is 4. In business, there are so many different ways you can approach the same problem. That's why it depends. And here, fast is important, but here, cheap is important. Because you want to last longer, right? Um, and the cheapest way of delivering stuff is the slowest way. If you think about it, airplane versus train. Right? Which one is more expensive? Airplane. Which one is faster? Airplane. So cheap is uh, slow is cheap. As a result, you build supply chains that are slow, but you can plan ahead. Slow doesn't mean you have to wait for it. Right? If it's going to take me one year to deliver you something, I can plan for it, and I can start shipping a year before so that you receive it on time. So it doesn't have to be late. It's just it will, it will travel slowly. So once I looked at development aid, I was working on a project. And you know, you're, you're, you're looking at development projects, and you're looking at people who live with a dollar a day, less than $2 a day. They eat every three, four days. So you see a lot of human suffering. Okay. And that led me, oh, I forgot about one more, but I'm going to come back to that. That led me to uh, forced labor research, um, and which also led me to sex trafficking research. So right now I have multiple research streams going on. I have one paper that I'm working on on labor, forced labor in um, uh, Bangladesh, and another paper that I'm working on sex trafficking in Cook County here in Chicago. Um, again, the approach is the same. I look at it from a supply chain perspective. So you may be thinking like sex trafficking, supply chain, how does that work? If you think about the human being as a commodity, because the criminals do, the criminals who are um, uh, trafficking women don't look at them as human beings. They look at them as any commodity, like think about pork, right? A lot of people, we have the, uh, the, the, um, the mercantile exchange in Chicago, the biggest commodity market in the United States in Chicago, where people sell you know, corn or, or soy or pork or oil, right? Um, they treat them like that. So that person doesn't mean anything. It's a, it's a way of making money. I buy that person. I store that person. I retail that person. I wholesale that person. So they look at it that way. If you come from that perspective, if you can strip out the humanity out of it, it's a supply chain. So we're looking at it as a supply chain problem. And then I, I mentioned, I forgot to mention what sustenance is. Um, there are humanitarian operations which doesn't fit both of these. For example, a food bank. If you think about a food bank, food banks exist without a disaster. We don't wait for a disaster to happen uh, to build a food bank, right? In Chicago, we have the food, uh, Chicago Food Repository, which is the Chicago's food bank. Uh, in the United States, there's the network of food banks we call Feeding America Network. That's about 40,000. That feeds 40,000 or so uh, soup kitchens, which feeds about 45 million Americans every day. Okay? So even though we are in the United States, we still have, obviously, poverty in the United States, and people, need, um, uh, people live in food insecure environments. So sustenance um, supply chains, uh, similar to food banks, they don't necessarily rush like a disaster supply chain, but they're not necessarily a development aid supply chain either. In the normal days, they act like a development supply chain, but if a disaster happens, for example, let's say a tornado hits Iowa, the Iowa Food Bank immediately switches from a development chain to a disaster chain. So in other words, they go from slow to fast in a minute, right? There is no commercial supply chain that can do that right now. So it's a brilliant way of operating, and commercial supply chains can learn a lot from them. So these guys can be um, uh, efficient and agile at the same time. They have the capabilities of both. So we look at them from a capability perspective, and how do organizations build such capabilities? 
All right, continuing with this, uh, with the development aid, as I said, I looked at people who are living in extreme poverty. That led me to researching base of the pyramid. Um, are you familiar with the terminology, base of the pyramid? Are you? What is it? What is it referring to? I can imagine the shape of the... Right. The, so it's the an economic yeah. pyramid, right? One percent of the people that are really, really rich are on top. And the base of the pyramid, um, if you think about it, the, the world has about 10 billion people, right? Until recently, that base consisted of uh, 2 billion out of, with a B, 2 billion people um, that live with a dollar a day or less than official, official definition of poverty, extreme poverty, according to the United Nations, is less than $2 a day. So there, there were 2 billion people living less than $2 a day with. Um, and 15, 20 years ago, we had the first sustainable development goals developed. One of the goals was ex, you know, alleviate poverty. And a lot of companies and organizations started working on that problem. It worked uh, because now we have today about 850 million people that are in extreme poverty. That's still a huge number, right? But if you think about it, we slashed it to half. It was 2 billion. Now we have less than 1 billion. And hence, we have the new SDGs, the new supply, uh, uh, Sustainable Development Goals that was passed in 2015. The, uh, the target is 2030, so another 15 years. The first one was established in 2000 with the target 2015. It worked. So now we have new goals that are going from 15 to 30. Um, and here, the research is, uh, th this is based on a uh, professor from University of Michigan. Uh, his name is Prahalat, P.K. Prahalat, uh, Indian guy. And he wrote a book about this. And he said, you know, corporations, international corporations, you're ignoring the, these people. But there are 2 billion people here. Even though they are very, very poor, if you combine their buying power, it's still a legitimate market. So instead of seeing them as poor people who need help, if you see them as a legitimate market, legitimate consumers, and serve them properly, right? You can make money, and you can imp also improve their lives. That was the goal, or the, the the logic of that book. And so now we are developing products and services. We, meaning the world, is developing products and services that are serving these people. What type of services? The biggest um, uh, service that is the most popular right now is. Um, uh, toilets. How do you build toilets in an environment where the sewage system doesn't exist? Right? So you have to, it's going to be just like the porta potties here when you go to a concert or something like that, right? You have porta potties and how do they work? You do your business and then one truck with a, with a crane or a winch comes in, takes it and carries it, dumps it somewhere and brings it back. Same idea. But these people need to pay for that service. So how do you make it affordable for them? Because toilet is not the only need. They also need other things, right? Uh, like lights. Most people in the base of the pyramid don't have access to electricity. So at night, they best case scenario, they will have candle lights. If you're a kid who's trying to get education so that you can move up in the pyramid and you have no light to study that limits you, right? So if you bring in, for example, solar, um, uh, solar lights, there are a bunch of startups actually that do that. You provide them electricity, uh, light at least, so they can study and they can go to, uh, to school. A local NGO called World Bicycle Relief, um, what they did is they basically focused on mobility. So um, coming from Turkey, in rural Turkey, this is also a problem. Um, you know, when, when I came to the United States, that was the first time I heard about the, the terminology child labor. I'm doing this. Um, and people were like, oh my God, child labor, child labor. And I looked at them and said, what's wrong with it? Because I just came to the United States, right? And everybody was like, these kids need to be in school. Okay. First of all, we don't call it child labor. We call it survival. Second of all, Yes, they need to be in school, but the nearest school to this village is 30 miles away. How do you expect that child to go to school, right? So what else is there other than working on the field, helping the family? Um, 
if you bring the school, absolutely, and they don't send the kid to the school, it's illegal in Turkey anyway. You cannot do that. Um, but there is no school. So mobility is key to education in some certain locations in this world. But if they don't have, you know, not, they can't afford a truck or car or anything. So World Bicycle Relief is established by the executive of uh, SRAM, S-R-A-M, uh, which is a bicycle company that makes high-end bicycles for for triathlon, triathlons and stuff. Their bicycles usually sell for five, six thousand dollars. And he basically said to his engineers, develop me a bicycle that is for Africa. You cannot break that thing. So they did. It's called a Buffalo. And it's 50 pounds of uh, automotive grade steel and automotive grade tires. Um, it's unbreakable. And it sells about $180 US dollars. They don't give away these bikes, they sell them. But just like a mortgage, you pay the bike, you pay for the bike in the long term. And what happens is once I give you mobility, you can either go to school and you can pay it back with your grades, okay? Or you can use it as a business. Some people use it as a taxi. So they carry a person in the back. Uh, I've seen people who have, you know, using two by fours extended the back and they carry goat milk, you know, and sell it. Uh, I've seen people who deliver HIV medication to little, you know, remote villages, and then they get paid for that service. So you can actually create a business out of that, right? So in other words, here we're talking about produ uh, products and services that I sell to you, but it improves your life, right? Instead of something like, you know, I give you a cell phone, and instead of, you know, adding communications, I'm also wasting a lot of time, right? Because you're downloading sugar, what is it called? The, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, something like that. You know, some, some game that you spend hours without producing anything. Um, so that's the idea of the base of the pyramid. I, again, I'm coming from a logistics perspective. I'm interested in how do you deliver these things because they, are, they tend to be in remote locations without roads and all that stuff. That's where drones come in. So we can still deliver to the base of the pyramid using different technologies. Um, so as a result of all this, and this was a progression in years, it didn't happen over the, over the year, uh, over the uh, 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 frame of a day. Um, I finished my dissertation in 2000. We are in 2020. So this is the last two decades of my life, basically. Um, so my research can be now summed up as supply chain research to alleviate human suffering. So I look at all of this. Um, on top of that, I mentioned the sustainable development goals. You know, in the business school, I always thought about, OK, this is nice, but how do I transfer or translate this to commercial enterprise, right? How do I do that? Well, with the sustainable development goals and the other thing is uh, corporate social responsibility. You probably heard about that, CSR. Um, corporations are now looking at these things. They, because they realize that, number one, their consumers are very sensitive to what's happening, okay? Um, and yesterday I was on a panel and somebody asked, like, why? why? What changed? What changed is something happened in 1994, 95. How many of you are born before that? Before 94, 95, okay. Uh, have you experienced life before internet? Okay. Life before internet? Yes. Oh, yes. Life before internet. Yes. <laughs> because, you know, there are certain people. Life before cell phone, I guess. Yes. There are certain people now that I guarantee you, you take their phone away, they cannot find their way home. They can't call their mother because they don't know the number. They, they don't have Google Maps, so they can't go back home. There are people like that in this world. Okay? When I was growing up, I had to memorize 50, 60 phone numbers. Right, my friends, my family, and all that stuff. Uh, I had to memorize paths, like tracks, to go to school, to go to gym, to go to I don't know bi the billiard salon, you know, whatever. Um, so, unfortunately, we're we're depending on that technology now because of the internet. Why is that important? It's important because before the internet, if something happened in Bangladesh, what was your means of learning about it? Newspaper if they report on it, right? So if people are forced labor, forced to work, I don't know, 
15 hour days with no pay in Bangladesh, would I hear about it in Turkey before the internet? No. But now we do. So the more you're exposed to this, the more you start caring. The more you start caring, the more you start expecting, right? And that's as a consumer. So when you, for example, see that, oh, Nike is using child labor in Vietnam, you stop buying Nike. So it has an effect, okay, on the business. But then you grow up, you finish college, right? And then you find a job at Nike. You're the same person. You're the same activist in here, and now you're expecting Nike to change their policies. So it's not just the consumers, but employees, the millennials, the Generation X, they expect that from their companies. So as a result of that, corporate social responsibility became a reality. It used to be just, you know, companies used to say, oh yeah, we recycle our photocopy paper. That's our cor CSR, corporate social responsibility. Now actually they're doing, changing their policies, doing business in a way that helps the local communities and all that stuff. We call that socially responsible operations. So that's how I carry this research into the business world, into the business school. How do you change your operational processes to make them more socially responsible? All right, so that was a long background. Um, that leaves me about half an hour to finish the other th tw 30 slides or so. Um, <laughs> so done, yeah, easy. Okay, perfect. Um, let's talk about what causes a disaster. Everyone thinks about, in me included, when I started this research, I thought uh, what, what causes a disaster is an event like earthquake, right? Or a flood. Those we call hazards in disaster literature. It's not a disaster unless it actually hurts people, right? So for example, in an uninhabited island, a volcano erupts, nobody dies, no animal gets hurt, or no, nothing happens, right? Is that a disaster? No. So we need to separate hazards from disasters. What leads a hazard to become a disaster is vulnerability. For example, if you decide to locate your house in a flood zone, you should not complain that your house has flooded. You make yourself vulnerable to that. Now, I, I sound like it's a choice, but in a lot of environments, it's not a choice. Because the rich basically takes up all the good places, high ground, and then the poor is forced to live in the low ground. Does this happen? Absolutely. Think about what happened in Katrina. New Orleans, New Orleans exactly. Exactly. So the, uh, the ninth ward in New Orleans is low ground. Well, there are no rich people living there, right? So it's the cheapest real estate you can get, and you go what you can afford. So unfortunately, that's the area also that got flooded. Um, so vulnerability basically causes disasters. The question then for us, if I want to kill disasters, I don't have to kill earthquakes. I just need to protect people against an earthquake, build better against an earthquake, educate people against an earthquake, right? We call that mitigation. So for example, in Japan, um, Japan is exposed to earthquakes frequently, right? Just like Turkey. Turkey has three fault lines. So the Turkish history is full of earthquakes. And, but we don't learn. Japanese learned. Um, so all the high rises are built on rollers because there are two types of way earth can shake. It either shakes like this way or this way. This is the worst. You, you can't protect against this, unfortunately. This, if you build your construction on rollers, when the earth is moving this way, basically the building just moves on the rollers and doesn't collapse, right? So that's construction engineering in innovation. So we can improve our engineering and come up with innovative techniques to protect people from hazards, right? And remove vulnerabilities. So the key is removing vulnerability. If you want to find a solution for disasters, remove vulnerabilities. How do I do that? For example, we talked about flood zones. If you tell someone you can't live there, does that solve the problem? No, it doesn't, because you need to also show me where else can I live, right? Um, you cannot live here, or you cannot sit in that chair, but find any other chair. Well, but, oh, by the way, to sit in that chair, you need to give me a million dollars. Is that a solution? No, right? So I need to come up with alternatives. It's just not enough to say, you know, I passed a law. By law, you cannot actually populate this area. It's not enough. I need to give alternatives. 
Um, the, some of these vulnerabilities are caused by societal factors. You know, we're getting crowded. Um, current population of Earth is 10 billion. We're expecting it to be 12 and uh, soon, very soon, 12 billion. And as the population increases, uh, people will move towards cities because that's where the jobs and healthcare is. So we expect mega cities. Um, you know, I grew up in Istanbul, about 15 million. Currently, I think the population is about 17 million, uh, three times the size of Chicago, Chicago land, not just Metro Chicago, but I mean Chicago land. Um, and Istanbul is expected to be 30 million by 2050. So you can think about Mumbai, you can think about Beijing, you can think about Delhi, you can think of, think about. Um, you know, Mexico City, these are already giant cities. They're going to be become either, uh, even bigger, right? So there's a whole area within the logistics field that studies city logistics because what's going to happen when the population triples, right? Istanbul streets are like this wide. So very common thing in, in Istanbul, for example, if, you're, if you look at cars, the side rear view mirrors, half of the cars will have damage like either cracked or missing or something. Why? The streets are so narrow, when you're driving, they actually hit each other. So now you have three, more, uh, three times more people living in the same city with the same size of sit streets, right? What's going to happen? Traffic will not move. So when I came to Chicago, everybody was complaining about the rush hour. The rush hour here, I laugh. This is not rush hour. Right? Come, to, come to Istanbul, I'll show you rush hour. You know? It's 24 hours almost. It's 24 hour street, 24 hour rush hour, right? I took uh, students, the Polish students, to Turkey. Um, we went to a factory visit. Uh, during the day, we went during the day. The, it took us a 40 minute bus ride because it's outside of Istanbul, where the factory we're visiting. It's a shipyard. Um, and at 5 o'clock, our meeting ended with the, you know, the, the horn, at, you know, indicating the end of the shift. With the horn, we also left, right? And the same travel that took us 40, hour, uh, 40 minutes took us two and a half hours to come back because of the rush hour. So city logistics is all about drones. How do you deliver stuff when the traffic is not moving? Um, or uh, little robots and all that stuff. MIT does a lot of research on that. Um, so population density is increasing and all that. Then the economic factors, you know, what, what is the cost of mitigation and how do you justify that? So the easiest way to explain that is if you are the mayor of Chicago, okay, Chicago has long winters, we use a lot of salt. What is the impact of that salt on our roads? Hmm? Destroys the roads, right? We have potholes. We complain about potholes all the time. You read it on the radios and all that stuff. So if I'm the city of Chicago mayor and I want to get reelected, okay, where should I spend the money? Building a flood wall because we're thinking, you know, with the climate change, the lake level will increase. So should I build a flood wall for billions of dollars or should I build, should I just fill out the potholes? Which one will get me elected? Exactly. Short term, right? Human beings are myopic in decision making, short term. We don't think about the long term. So mitigation is a long term investment. Like that flood wall will be necessary sooner or later, but it's a long term investment. So you can't justify it quite. It's very hard to justify. But you know, preparedness, filling the potholes is easier, easier to justify. But what we know from experience is every dollar you spend on mitigation saves four dollars in response after a disaster. Okay? Because the more you have mitigation, the less damage you have at the end, uh, after the disaster. But it is hard to explain that to voters, to people. Um, the other economic factor is the distribution of wealth. You know, the rich gets richer and poor gets poorer, right? Uh, during lunch, Isuri and I were talking about robotics. He's a robotics guy. And um, I'm just starting a research on um, these uh, textile robots, sew bots, I think they're called, sewing bots. And, you know, these companies in, in Bangladesh, which is basically the biggest textile industry in the world, are uh, thinking about replacing the women working in the factories with these sobots. Robots will be doing sewing. What happens to the women?
they are they are jobless, right? Do they, are they educated? Can they find another job? No, they're not. Do you provide education? Remember the example I gave? If I tell you to get up from there and then go to another seat, but the seat is expensive, do you have an alternative? You don't. So these economic factors and the distribution of wealth will go worse and worse. Okay? And then the question is, when you're helping people or when you're mitigating, who are you helping? Who's the easiest target to help? Usually it's the rich. And who can protect better? For example, protection insurance is one way of protection, right? I can buy flood insurance, earthquake insurance. If I lose my summer home and I have earthquake insurance, the insurance pays me back. The poor cannot afford the insurance. So when they lose, they lose everything, right? So that separation will get more and more, uh, further and further. And then the other thing is lack of leadership and trust, that which happened to me in Turkey. I had no trust to the Turkish government after seeing no action in, in three days, right? So lost all my tru uh, trust to the government and to the Red Crescent at the time. And then the leadership was not there, simply not there. Uh, in, a, in a crisis situation, you don't need managers. You need leaders. Managers are good for managing status quo. Leaders change things, right? So it's a different type of skill. And in a crisis situation, you need leaders. So these are some of the causes of disasters. And this is the common disaster management cycle. You know, this is where the disaster happens. We go, we start with search and rescue operations. This is basically uh, the, fir the first three days, four days. Uh, you go there with the dogs and, you know, find people under the rubble and all that stuff. And then relief, this is when you just start distributing food, water, shelter, and all that. Uh, and recovery, you start actually cleaning the debris, okay? And reconstruction, that's exactly what that means, right? And then mitigation is, okay, now we're back to where we are. How do we prevent the next disaster from happening? That's where mitigation uh, um, comes in. And preparedness only happens when you have a disaster that tells you it's coming, like a hurricane. We know a hurricane is coming. We know the, the forecasted landing sites and all that stuff. We know the, 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 the power of it. Um, unfortunately, I can... I know a, a Turkey will experience another earthquake. I know for a fact. That's a fact. But I don't know when. I don't know how big. So it's hard to prepare for that. We do have actually uh, depots with shelters and all that stuff uh, located all over Turkey um, based on where the fault lines are. Uh, but that's all we can prepare. With hurricanes, however, I can actually come closer and closer so that I can help very quickly. Uh, I love this quote. This, one of, this quote is one of the quotes that actually made me start this research. Uh, John Telford used to work for UNHCR, and he said, the most deadly killer in any humanitarian emergency is not dehydration, is not measles, is not malnutrition, or the weather, it is bad management. Right? And I'm a management professor. So basically that made me, that single quote made me start research um, operations management in disasters. Uh, very quickly, what's the difference between natural disasters and, and com uh, armed conf uh, conflicts, complex emergencies, we call them? Like this is Syria. I'm sorry, Libya, it says over there. Um, but now, for example, we have conflict, uh, armed conflicts in Syria, obviously, in Libya, again. Um, Sudan, DRC, Rwanda, you know, you have probably heard about the genocide and all that stuff, right? So uh, Liberia. So these are all, you know, boiling pots. There's always some sort of conflict. And then the difference between them is usually the political complexity. For example, uh, in Iraq, the American media, when you're listening to news about Iraq, they talk about insurgents, insurgency. Well, what does that mean, right? There is hundreds of different tribes fighting with each other. So the, the fact that you call them all blanket insurgents doesn't make sense. From a distance, yeah, they're all fighting with each other. They're insurgents. But if you're trying to deliver aid, and you need to go from A to B, and you need to cross five different tribes' areas, just like you know, traveling to gang uh, areas here in Chicago, right? West side, south side, north side, whatever. And when you're passing through the gang's territory, you need to either pay tax to that uh, gang or, or be careful, right? Uh, watch your back, whatever. 
So if you're delivering convoys of rice or beans or whatever, right, food, do you think those uh, gangs or those thugs or those insurgents, whatever they are, will just let you go? Oh, yeah, UN truck. Okay, go. No, it doesn't happen that way, right? You start with 10 trucks, you end up with two trucks. The other eight trucks are tax that you actually <laughs> drop on the way. So the question then is, what is the best logistics? It's not, I'm not just talking about routing, but I'm also talking about negotiations and all that stuff. Um, you don't have that problem here, okay? So usually you don't have that problem in a natural disaster. Um, also the duration, a natural disaster is quick, it happens, boom, and then you help people, and then in a couple of weeks you're back to normal. And this can go on, how, how long is the Syrian war now? seven, eight years, right? So we have close to three million Syrian refugees in Turkey, okay? Close to three million. Only 250,000 of them live in camps, in refugee camps. The rest is out. Streets, homes, hotels, whatever they can afford. Why only 250,000? I talked to the uh, Red Crescent that is official, that is responsible for these camps because they thought when the Syrian conflict started, it was going to be three months to six months event. <coughs> right. So they basically prepared 25 camps with 10,000 people each. They're well designed, they're excellent camps. They're by the book, okay, if you visit those camps. Everything is by the book. UNHCR has a book actually that tells you how to create a camp. Everything is by the book, perfect, but only, only holds 250,000 people total. And then it's been seven years and those three million Syrians are still in Turkey, right? They're jobless because they're not, the, the uh, Erdogan government never declared them as refugees. So there's a legal aspect to this. They are guests because wh what's the difference? Refugee has some legal rights from an international humanitarian law perspective. There are certain rights given to refugees. But if you don't declare them refugees, they're just guests, they have no rights. And that creates a social clash because the first year, everyone in Turkey were like, oh, brothers and sisters, we're Muslims, you're Muslims, come, you know. Two years, three years later, they go like, enough already, you know. Seven years later, now the, the, half of the Turkish population don't want them there because they're taking jobs, they're taking resources. Does this sound similar to what's happening in the United States right now? Right? immigrants out because you don't, you're taking resources, right? So the length of it, the duration of it is very different, very important factor. Uh, this is, I just talked about this, but complex emergencies basically are armed conflict and all that stuff. You have uh, food insecurity can lead to long-term problems like famine, so it's not a temporary thing. What is famine? Well, um, in a lot of the underdeveloped nations, uh, farmers are small-time farmers. They're sustenance farmers. Uh, here in the United States, for example, I used to teach at Texas A&M uh, when I was doing my PhD, and I met a student whose dad was a cattle farmer. He owned cows, right? So in my country, if you're a cattle farmer, best case scenario, you have 10, maybe 20 cows. Do you know how, how many cows this, guy, this kid's dad had? Hmm? Uh, try 12,000. And he was a small player. Big players have hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands. So they're, they're millionaires, actually, Where right? Texas. So, so if you come to my country, right, and let's say we have war, the easiest thing you can make me suffer, kill my cows or kill my goat, kill my chicken, and leave. Then I go hungry, right? So I don't have to kill you. I can make you suffer long term just by taking your you know, sustenance. So that, that's why food insecurity in armed conflicts leads to famine because that's a target for, for the fighting people. Um, and then you know, economies, economic resources driven migration and all that stuff. So you know, we, we have the biggest refugee crisis in the, that the world has, is, is experiencing or has experienced in the, world, in the history. Um, we have more refugees today in the world than the Second World War. 
Nobody knows about it. Nobody talks about it. Um, unfortunately, one of the reasons why you see more right-wing governments taking over in the world, not just you know, in the US or even Hungary, Germany, and all that stuff, uh, anti-refugee uh, sentiment, there's a reason for it, because we have so many refugees. And unfortunately, it's not going to go away, because these refugees were caused by armed conflicts, natural disasters, famine, and all that stuff. And the next wave, we talk about climate refugees. With climate change, we will have more refugees. Think about the nation of Maldives. Do you know where it is? It's a beautiful spot. I'd like to go to there for vacation. I could never afford it. Um, but now that I work at DePaul. <laughs> uh, so the nation of Maldives is about 800 islands. Uh, the population is something like 700,000, I believe. It's an it's a, it's a Islam uh, nation. And when the... Um, um, water levels rise, by 2050, the whole nation of Maldives will be underwater. So where do those 700,000 people go? That's a climate refugee problem, right? Same thing with the Seychelles and any low ground, uh, people will have to move. Hmm? A lot of people like Miami. Oh yeah, Part, a big chunk of Florida will go bye-bye, yeah. Manhattan will go bye-bye. Um, so where do we move those people? Like in the United States, they are internally displaced people. We call them IDPs. Uh, if they come from outside, obviously, they become refugees. Um, so we will have more refugees. And then the question is, what do we do with them? How do we handle? So we have a new area within logistics called refugee logistics. Because we used to treat refugees stationary, like they are in a camp. So just like an island, I would bring water and food to the camp. And I would take trash out of the camp, right? But what the, uh, the Syrian uh, conflict showed us is most refugees now are in transit. They're actually moving, right? So they started walking from Syria over Turkey, Greece, over Hungary, Serbia, to Europe, right? They walked all the way. So if you want to help them, give them food and all that stuff, you know, you turn around, where did they go? So we used to, for example, source, you know, purchase um, uh, relief items based on the idea that they would stay in a camp. So we would buy really thick winter gr grade um, um, blankets for them, right? It's heavy. So if, you're, if you have only a single backpack and you're walking thousands of miles, do you think you're going to carry a heavy blanket? No. And that's exactly what happened in Greece. They distributed these blankets and then they found them thrown away on the sides of the roads, right? So they switched uh, immediately, UNHCR switched immediately from buying blankets to buying those. They look like aluminum foil. The, the, you know, if you run the Chicago Marathon, they give you one after, afterwards, you know? Lightweight stuff, right? It's a totally different supply chain. Where you buy it from is different. How you buy it is different. Who manufactures is different. Completely different supply chain. So we had to adjust to that. Um, so what do people need? We talked about blankets, but what else do they need? Obviously, water and sanitation, food and kitchen sets. Um, it, it, it is very difficult to serve thousands of people food, cooked food. So what you rather do is you give them a kitchen set, and then you give them uncooked food, like dried beans or rice, and so that they can cook their own food. The other problem is all this needs to be culturally sensitive. So for example, um, even though, yeah, it was like Muslims, Muslims, and all that stuff with the Syrians, the Syrians have a different taste for bread. They like lavash bread, like the tortilla bread, and we like the Italian bread type of bread, okay, in Turkey. So in the camps, they were serving them f Turkish food with the bread that we like, and they had tremendous amounts of food waste because the Syrian refugees didn't like it. They were not eating it. So then they switched, and they said, okay, we will give you kitchen sets, and we will give you a little visa card. We open the market. Whatever you want to cook, go shop from there. Here is a visa card with money in it. It solved the trash problem. Food waste dropped to zero. Right? So all of these things are because you're thinking that these people need what you want or what you would like, but it's not like that. They have different cultures, right? different expectations. So it needs to be culturally sensitive. And then, of course, medical assistance and all that stuff. And then this kitchen set needs to have fuel, whether it's propane or 
coal or whatever it is. So these are the basic life support needs. And then in every disaster, you have also uh, some curveballs uh, from the baseball terminology. What that means? That means a trick, you know, tricky situation. For example, in um, outside of Richmond, Virginia, I used to live there, there was a small town called Franklin. And Franklin got flooded because the river flooded. And Franklin is a rural town. Their main income source is peanuts. They grow peanuts. They have trees, right? So all the peanuts after the harvest are loaded into silos. Okay? From the silos, they are loaded to trucks and shipped out. So flooding <coughs> happened when the silos were full with peanuts. Okay? And the flood was, flood water was up to one story tall. So one story tall, this much water at the bottom of a silo. What happens to peanuts when you wet them? They start to grow, and first they fermentate. So they, they create methane. Okay? Methane is a, not only just toxic, but it's also flammable. Okay? So all that methane started rising up, collected on top of the silo. Each peanut silo basically became a rocket. The fire department didn't know how to handle it. Because you know, if you try to break it so that you can release the methane, and the silos are metal, any spark, boom, you're on the moon. So they didn't even know how to handle that. That was a curveball. And they spent a lot of time and resources to figure out that problem. So these are standard things. And then you will always have non-standard problems in disasters. And then the other thing that is left out most of the times is the psychological needs part. Every survivor of a disaster, major disaster, experiences PTSD post-traumatic stress syndrome, which we learned from soldiers you know, that go to Afghanistan and all that stuff. Well, these people who survived this, this horrible condition also go through PTSD. So just like giving them shelter, food, and all that stuff, you also need to give them psychological help because that comes out later, and, and they suffer through it. They, they lose their jobs because they can't keep a job. And, you know, it, it is still suffrage, right? But we focus, again, humans are myopic decision makers. We focus on the short term, and then we kind of ignore the long term. All right, so a little, of, a little bit uh, of um, OR in disaster activities, if you will, um, because this is the computing slash digital media school, right? For the computing gurus in the room, um, you know, some of the problems, algorithmic problems that we deal with are dynamic vehicle routing or static vehicle routing. So for example, one thing I will look at uh, with this Fulbright um, award in Finland next year is they have a system that I will actually show you uh, in a minute called iTrack, which collects a lot of information from the convoy truck's video camera. Okay, So you have big data. And the whole idea of the video camera is in the background you have AI. Okay, looking at the um, um, pictures it's taking and trying to see what's ahead of you, far ahead of you, okay? And tell you whether there's a checkpoint or a, um, um, you know, a cannon or a tank or something waiting on the road way before you can even see that, okay? Based on the pixelations. Um, and then so that you can actually stop and then reroute. Um, but vehicle routing problems tend to be static, meaning just like, for example, if you wanted to go from here to, I don't know, let's say um, um, I went the other day to a place called Wood Lake. Never been there before, so I asked Google, like, Google Maps, how do I go to Wood Lake, right? And it drew me the road map and all that stuff. That's static. But if I actually, uh, in the middle of the road, get out of the highway or something, then Google Map will recalculate, right? That's the dynamic part. So I have to recalculate all the time my vehicle route to keep my convoy safe. That's the idea of iTrack. So we will be developing ve dynamic vehicle routing models, mathematical models for that. Um, aircraft scheduling, you know, this was a big issue in Haiti. Um, the earthquake in Haiti destroyed part of the airpo airport and the uh, marine ports. So the only point of entrance to Haiti was Port-au-Prince Airport, which had only one landing strip. 
So imagine now thousands of NGOs and people are trying to fly in aid, but you have one landing strip. In other words, all of us trying to get out of that door, but there's only one door. What's going to happen? You have to have a queue, right? And then somebody needs to decide a priority. Like the, the classic in the movies is women and children first, right? That's a prioritization scheme. So if the, um, in this case, the US Air Force took over the, um, uh, the, the, the Port au Prince Airport, and basically the US Air Force decided what the priority is. So before any NGOs stuff landed, Marines landed because they thought the priority should be security. So obviously based on your bias, you will have different prioritization schemes, right? And some people complained a lot because like um, the American Red Cross, for example, had two planes. One plane contained the, um, the, uh, the hospital and the other plane contained the doctors and the nurses. The hospital landed to Port-au-Prince. Doctors and nurses were uh, redirected to Dominican Republic. So they had the hospital set up and they were waiting for doctors and nurses to come and serve. Right? And it took them another week to actually drive down to Port-au-Prince. So these are you know, prioritization problems and, and scheduling problems. This is a classic scheduling and sequencing problem. Uh, last. <laughs> Every problem is a leadership problem, if it's a top-down approach, right? Um, so last, last mile distribution refers to what Amazon you know, drops off to your house. That's last mile. It comes from a warehouse to your home, right? It doesn't have to be a single mile, obviously, but it's the last stage of the delivery. So last mile can be problematic because if everyone is in a camp, that's great. That's why we use camps. Right? If you have thousands of people in one location, I can go one location and drop it off. But if these thousands of people live in remote villages, that's very expensive and time consuming and complex. So the last mile distribution can be very, very challenging. Um, service design and customer satisfaction. That's the biggest problem we have in, in uh, human, humanitarian relief because, you know, I just bought coffee, right? Let's say they gave me coffee cold. What would I do? Complain about it or not buy it, return it, it's cold, take it back, give me my money, right? I have a lot of options. Well, when I'm distributing food to people in the refugee camp, what do they have as an option? Nothing. 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 If they don't like it, they, they are most of the times thankful that somebody else is helping them, right? So you have no consumer feedback. That's why, that's why you cannot calculate cust customer satisfaction. You don't know if your delivery of aid was successful or not, if people liked it or not, because we don't, like, even here, we have student evaluations. If I suck in class, I know, because you tell me. Right? You fill out the evaluations, one out of five. Ooh, <laughs> something went wrong. I know, I, you give me feedback, but in this, in this scenario, I have no feedback. And that's a big problem, um, because for the other problem is for uh, a lot of NGOs, there's no target. Like a company has a target, a, a, they have a budget target. This year we want to sell $1 million worth of product, that's a target. So if I'm below that, I know I wasn't successful. If I'm above that or equal to that, I know I was successful. Well, what an NGO does, they go to a camp and when they're coming in, they say, we will help the most people we can afford. We will help as many people as, they, as we can. What does that mean? Is three people enough? Is that as many as people as we can? Or, you know, if you're a big organization, do you, should you be helping 3,000 people or 30,000 people? There's no number. So there's no benchmark. And because of that, we cannot justify whether your relief uh, efforts or uh, operations were successful or not. So these are all uh, operational issues, you know. Um, in operations management, we, we care about metrics and measurements and all that stuff, obviously. And there are no standards. That's another problem. Within an organization, there are standards. UNHCR has standards. IFRC, International Federation of Red Cross Red Crescent, has standards. There's a bit book that is this thick for IFRCR when they're buying stuff, when they're sourcing stuff, purchasing stuff, okay, for standards. But between UNHCR and IFRC, the standards don't match. So if two organizations are serving the same refugee camp, 
you may get one type of tent, I may get another type of tent. And then what happens is I look at your tent and I go like, why is your tent better than my tent? Right? So if you're going to deliver, there's a rule actually in humanitarian relief. If you, you know, how many people in this room? I don't know. Let's say a dozen, 12 people. And I have enough cookies, there you go, enough brownies for eight people. Okay? The rule in humanitarian relief is if you don't have enough for everyone, you don't deliver. Because what's going to create, what you will create is you will create a black market. You will actually help the gangs, and the thugs in the refugee camp. What, that, what they will do is they will grab it, and then they, they will turn around and sell it to you. So I only deliver if I have enough for everyone. Okay? That creates delays. So I need to also sequence and schedule that arrival. Um, so. What is the difference between humanitarian supply chains and commercial supply chains? Very, sh very um, fast. Commercial supply chains, they are well planned. They look at a long term strategy, usually. They're well coordinated. We have in, in the, I teach logistics and supply chain management at, in the Dree House College. We talk about a bunch of coordination mechanisms. We talk about big data. We talk about blockchain, right? all kinds of stuff that I can use in commercial supply chains because they have money, they can afford the infrastructure, technology, and all that stuff. In humanitarian supply chains, the objective is not clear. The objective is alleviate human suffering. Um, if I give you a glass of water, did I alleviate your suffering? Is that good enough? You know, the objective here is very clear. Increase shareholder value, make profits. Um, here, you also deal with limited resources. I can buy resources here. I don't, I don't have that luxury here. Um, there is huge uncertainty. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. For example, with an earthquake, you have aftershocks. So it's not a one and done deal, right? Earthquake happened. OK, let's go in and serve. No, more aftershocks will actually create more issues. So there's uncertainty. There's also a sense of urgency. We talked about that already. And you always work in a political environment. Now, this used to be not a big deal for these guys, but these guys are now also worried about that. We call it ESG risk, environmental social governance risk. The G in the governance actually talks about the political environment. Because if you want to do Turkey, if you want to do business in Turkey for right now, you got to work with Mr. Erdogan. Okay? So the, everybody in Turkey knows that if you want to do a big project in Turkey, you need to give 15% to Mr. Erdogan. That's the president of the country, if you didn't know. Okay? So <laughs> there's a presidential tax, <laughs> also called bribery. Um, <laughs> no, it's a gift. It's a gift, exactly. <laughs> so in a humanitarian scenario, every humanitarian scenario is, is political because, first of all, something happened in Turkey, and Erdogan government wants to show off. You know, I am strong enough. If they don't declare an emergency as a foreign NGO or humanitarian organizations, you cannot come in to Turkey. So this happened several years ago in Iran. In Iran, in Bam, uh, the, the, the town is called B-A-M, Bam, there was an earthquake. The Iranian government declared emergency. And they said, we need foreign help except from Israel. That's a ridiculous statement, right? We need foreign help. Please come help. But if you're Israeli, don't. So that's a political statement. And in every humanitarian scenario, you have that political aspect. Uh, even in the United States, if, if a state or a city declares, uh, doesn't declare emergency, you cannot go help. They cannot come with federal money and all that stuff. So there is always a political issue. All right. How much more time do I have, Isra? Because I can talk all day, but yeah. it's Friday, so. So we can have like another 10 minutes. Okay, another 10 minutes. I'll finish in 10 minutes. So this shows you uh, the difference between corporate supply chains and humanitarian supply chains. One thing we already talked about, there's no feedback from the beneficiaries, from the survivors. Okay. The other thing is the money flow. In uh, corporate supply chains, the stockholders, shareholders finance the company. They invest into the company, right? So there's money flow, and then sometimes we pay back dividends. That's why it's dot, dot, dot over here. But from also there's money, from, money flow from customers, right? They pay us for the products and services. 
and then we pay the suppliers. Usually that money flow also doesn't exist here. Um, so basically the beneficiaries, in, in this case the consumer, is kind of left out. We help them and we go like, okay, shut up and take what I give you. That's it, right? And that creates a huge problem because if you approach this as a supply chain business type of problem, we rely on that feedback. Even if you don't give me written feedback or tell me you know, whether you liked the coffee or not, if you didn't like my coffee, you just don't buy it. That's still a signal, right? My revenues will start going down. That means that tells me that I'm not doing something right. But I don't have that in the humanitarian um, section, se sector. The other problem in the humanitarian sector is immediately after a disaster, the movement of goods is supply driven. In other words, this, whatever supply I have, that decides on what I ship. Okay? If I have beans in the warehouse, I ship beans in the warehouse. Do I ask you whether you like beans or not? No. So it is purely supply driven. However, there's a point where you have to switch to a demand driven because you will realize that what are, you know, just like the Syrian refugee scenario that I gave you, like the bread you're shipping is creating a lot of waste. Also, there might be a lot of kind of switch chain commodities being shipped. Exactly. So everybody has blankets, nobody has tents <laughs> or food or something like that. So at some point you switch to demand driven. Where that um, switch over point is, there's no research on that. Um, it changes from scenario to scenario. The principles should be the same, but then nobody did research on it. So it's a big research question. Um, the other thing is there are some research, there is some, re there is some research that focuses on uh, categorizing these humanitarian supply chains. Since I have little time, I'm going to go very quickly over them. We usually, this, um, Mark Lachlan, um, I think his first name is John, um, they looked at uh, the environment they operate in, and it interrupted operations or environments is where humanitarian supply chains work, and uninterrupted status quo type of environments is where uh, commercial supply chains work. So this is peaceful times, this is like war times, if you will. That was one uh, framework. The other framework comes from Kovach and Tatam. Um, so they looked at uh, similar to, again, war, peace idea, they looked at dormant versus inaction supply chains. Dormant, you focus on preparation, you're trying to be lean, meaning low cost, okay? And then when you're in action, disaster relief, you, you tend to switch to an agile type of supply chain. What's an agile supply chain? What's a lean supply chain? Easiest way to explain. Are you familiar with greyhound dogs? Greyhound dogs, like racing dogs? No, no, not the bus company. The, the dog on the bus company. Okay. okay, That dog is bred to be very fast because they're used for dog racing, like horse racing. But all they do is this. this. They run in circles. Okay, Nothing else. They're designed to be fast. That's all. That's a lean dog. Are you familiar with an Australian shepherd dog or, you know, those black and white dogs like, you know, they, they herd, you know, uh, sheep and all that stuff? They're agility dogs. They can do all kinds of stuff. They can run, they can jump, they can go under, they can go sideways and all that stuff, right? That's agility. They're not necessarily as lean and fast as a greyhound, but they are multi, um, they're very flexible, they're multi-dimensional. That's what agility means. So your operation needs to go from lean to agile, from a greyhound to an Australian shepherd dog like this in a, in a scenario of a disaster. Okay, so peace to war, we talked about that. Here, you're talking about a lot of intelligence gathering because what happens in war or disaster is there's a lot of uncertainty. You need to collect data. Where are the people? What are their needs and all that stuff? Initially, we use satellites. Before we even go there, we look at the satellites and try to estimate the damage. And then what we do is we send out um, uh, needs assessment teams. So usually a team of three, four people, they land there before anyone else and they walk around and they look at, they talk to people, they try to guesstimate what the needs are, and then they extrapolate, right? They talk to 10 people, they say, we, we need this much food. Um, okay, and the development here during the, we talked about this, uh, development supply chains are lean, and then when you switch to relief, 
you are more agile, et cetera, et cetera. So moving on, um, this framework is by me and another colleague of mine. And you already, you guys already know these two supply chains. I talked about them, right? These are agile, these are lean. And then I also introduced you to the sustenance aid supply chains, which is like food banks, Salvation Army, blood banks. They can be both. So no, no need to spend time on that. I'm going to skip these two slides because those are the things we already talked about. And if, you're, if you care about sustainability, uh, the sustainability studies within humanitarian studies are very young, very uh, new. And in disaster relief, most focus is on social sustainability, so saving people's lives, bringing people's lives to normal again, right? In development aid supply chains, we focus on economic sustainability, okay? creating education, creating jobs, and all that stuff. And in sustenance supply chains, we focus on environmental sustainability. So for example, food banks focus on reducing food waste. Uh, Salvation Army, Goodwill, what do they do? They have stores, right? You give them your old clothes, and some of them, they sell the, the unsellable ones, like really old t-shirts, underwear, and stuff like that. They sell to uh, recyclers. If it's cotton, for example, if you have cotton t-shirts, recyclers buy it, shred it, make new cotton yarn from it, and make new t-shirts from it. So they recycle. Their focus is on um, environmental sustainability. OK. Um, most of these challenges we already talked about. However, the biggest challenge in terms of supply chain is coordination within the humanitarian world. Um, coordination requires information. So what is coordination? So if, if all of us wanted to go see a movie, right, we need to coordinate. We need to, we need to decide which movie to see. Let's say it's a Parasite. Right? Um, we, need to, we need to decide which movie theater to see it in, right? X movie theater, whatever. We need to decide what time. Are we going to have dinner before that or not, right? So all of these decisions we need to do so that we can meet at the same location at the same time and see the movie together. That's coordination. But to be able to do that, I, we need to share that information. I'm available. I'm not available. I can do Wednesday. I cannot do Friday. We need to share information. So this is the biggest problem in humanitarian relief because you mentioned what if a village or a refugee camp receives all the beans or all the blankets, but no food, no water, no shelter, whatever, right? It happens, actually. It happens very frequently because of lack of coordination. So if you have multiple NGOs, they're all distributing blankets, and they look at, oh, there are people in need here. They all come there, right? And instead of coordinating, okay, I go you know, give them blankets, you go give them food, you go give them this. Instead of doing that, they all attack. Um, standardization of services and, and products is another issue. We just mentioned the, uh, the tents, like my tent is better than yours kind of thing, right? Um, that coordination requires information, we said. How do you manage that information? How do you distribute that information? How does that information diffuse, go into the people, to, to the people? Uh, because one of the problems here is organizations have the information, but beneficiaries, the survivors, don't. So they just sit there in a refugee camp waiting. And they see people, but they don't know what, who they are, what they're distributing, or when is water coming, when is food coming. Uh, are we going to get any uh, medical aid because my children is sick? So they need information, right? Um, that information is not diffusing into the camps, into the beneficiaries that fast. And this is a big problem. If you don't remember anything from today's lecture, okay, remember one thing. If you want to donate, if you want to be helpful, donate cash. Don't donate clothing, food, toys. All that creates donation pollution. The, the of official name is unsolicited gifts in kind. Okay? Unsolicited gifts in kind clogs the supply chain. And you may be thinking, like, you know, why? Um, after the Haiti earthquake, they received a container full, container full. Have you seen a container? That's a lot, right? A container full of sex toys at the Port of Prince Airport. Why? Because one company decided to empty their warehouse with old products, and in this case, the product happens to be sex toys. 
and they donated it, shipped it out. They got a tax break for it, and it became somebody else's problem. Now, some people need to move that container, empty it, incinerate it, right? That's money, that's resources, that's labor that you need to help other people instead of doing that. Clothing, there's piles of clothing in Katrina, piles, like mountains of clothing, because it was too much. And it was out there molding, so you couldn't distribute it, and nobody was touching it. I asked the Red Cross official, why are you not like incinerating it, burning it? He says, are you crazy? If I go there with, with a lighter fluid or something like that and I start burning it and CNN camera catches me doing that, do you think I will receive donations ever again? The newspaper will say, Red Cross is burning your donations, right? They can't risk it. So what they do is after the, earth, after the disaster, they allocate resources, money, labor, trucks to move it away from CNN's eyes and incinerate it or bury it or something. But that's money. Right? So the easiest thing you can do as a, as a consumer to help is donate cash. Because cash I can use for everything. I can, I can buy food, I can buy shelter, I can, buy, I can move water, I, anything I, I want. Gives me flexibility. Um, okay, I'm going to jump over this because I took way too much time of yours. And I want to come to this, since this is the Computing and Digital Media School. Are you familiar with Industry 4.0? Okay, good. You're familiar. So Industry 4.0, Internet of Things, right? And deep learning, machine learning. These are the things that are happening in our lives, AI, uh, in our lives today. In the commercial world, these we see now, okay? In the humanitarian world, we don't have too many options or too many examples of it. And just to give you a couple of examples, this is what's happening in the commercial world now. We talk, about, we talk about smart warehouses, basically no humans, look, ma, no hands kind of warehouses. You can turn off the lights, leave, robots will take care of it. Amazon has a bunch of them, okay? Um, spare parts, we do 3D printing now instead of holding spare parts in stock. Uh, autonomous B2C logistics, basically drones, drone deliveries. Uh, supply, uh, analytics, prescriptive analytics, descriptive analytics, right? Big data analytics is a huge thing. This is all happening in the business world right now. These links are videos or, or websites. For the sake of time, I'm not going to do that. I can share the presentation with Isuru, and then you can distribute it. Um, basically, AI in convoy security is iTrack uh, project in, in Europe that looks at the camera, and there's an AI in the background that looks at the pictures and figures out what's ahead of you. Satellite technology, we actually have remote sensing uh, technology here, looking at satellite pictures and uh, finding uh, locations and uh, um, the size of the destruction. Telemedicine, basically having medicine through a cell phone. So, you know, turn the camera to yourself and the doctor looks at you and uh, the software in it looks at your skin color whether you're pale or not, it looks like it looks at your eyes to just guesstimate your temperature. So there are a lot of things uh, medical people can do with, with a cell phone. And there are uses of it in Vietnam already. It's called M-Health, Mobile Health um, uh, Program. Face recognition and identification of aid. Same thing with uh, iPhones. You know how the new iPhones has face recognition software to open up, right? So one, one of the problems in aid distribution is how do I know if, I already distrib if somebody already distributed food to you, right? Let's say you signed it. That's not good enough for me because the gangs will actually co collect signatures and all that stuff and collect all the aid and then turn around and sell. I can do fingerprinting, right? But if I'm just looking at it as a visual, I can't tell your fingerprint from mine. I'm not forensic scientist, right? What I can do is I can use a software and take a picture of, with my camera and say, like, oh, this is who you are. You, know, you are who you are that you're saying. Or I can use face recognition. So World Vision is a big NGO. It's the world's largest NGO. Uh, they use now face recognition when they're distributing food so that they make sure that one family or one person doesn't receive more than what they're supposed to. 3D printing, uh, there's an NGO that I'm on the technical advising committee called Field Ready. 
Field Ready's whole goal is to bring manufacturing innovation to a disaster site or location. So instead of moving stuff, they try to make stuff on location. And they started with 3D printing. Um, they are 3D printing in Nepal and also in Haiti. In Haiti, for example, uh, one hospital was having issues with um, uh, ladies who gave birth having infections because they didn't have um, umbilical cord cr clamps. So the, after they sever the umbilical cord, separate the baby, you know, there was no clamp. It's a plastic thing, right? So they were tying strings. And, you know, either the baby or the mother was getting infected. So they actually went there with a 3D printer, printed 150 umbilical cords in 20 minutes. I mean, umbilical cords, umbilical cord cramps, the plastic clamps, in 20 minutes. Fixed the problem like that. Um, and drones. In Africa, the drones are used a lot. In the United States, unfortunately, because of the legal uh, situation, FAA still didn't allow commercial drone usage. Um, so a lot of the drone companies that are hoping to operate in the United States are testing them in Africa. So there is blood delivery with drones, HIV medication delivery with drones, uh, mosquito spraying with drones. So there are a lot of drone usage uh, already in humanitarian world. Exactly. Um, so I think this one is a video. These are websites links. So you can click on those links and find out more if you're interested. Um, what has been done so much so far is there are a lot of decision support systems that have been developed. Um, there's a lot of research on response, recovery, and relief, except mitigation. There's not much research on mitigation. Um, infrastructure design, not much has changed. We still have the same infrastructure design. Uh, this is a paper I published in 2006. So I basically did a comparison between what, I pub what was being done in 2006 and now. Coordination, we have some research on coordination, some improvement in coordination, but more can be done. But um, what else is needed, since this was supposed to be a research talk, I guess, which is a very long research talk, um, more research on co coordination, multi-level modeling. So a lot of the math modeling, if, you, if you're doing math modeling, a lot of the math modeling is one level. And that, re that actually goes back to this idea. If you're coordinating at, with multiple organizations, you need multi-level models um, at the individual level, organization level, team level, organization level, um, governance level, governance level, etc. Multi-method research, there's no math model that can fix all of this, so you need to actually combine math modeling with other methods like survey techniques and all that stuff. Um, Data-centric research, there's a lot of research without data that, that is being done, unfortunately. Uh, development of simple affordable solutions, I think among these, this is the most important to me because humanitarian sector doesn't have money. So if you come up with a solution that requires expensive technology, they can't afford it. Most humanitarians today, if they have Excel on their laptops, they're lucky. So if you go like, oh yeah, SAP does this amazing ERP system, or, you know, why don't you buy that? They can't afford that. So your systems, whatever solution you produce, needs to operate on their systems, which should be very, very simple. So we need to come up with simple solutions. And final slide as far as I remember. Um, what's coming up? Climate change, huge water crisis in the world, food shortages in the world. One of the biggest issues is we don't have enough food to feed 12 billion people. Um, if we have it, it's not distributed equally. So it's uh, located in one location, in one space. So we need to create more food. And there's a lot of research on that. And then my research would be how do you distribute that, OK? Um, Poverty alleviation, the, the sustainable development goals, one, num, number one, I think, is poverty alleviation. Maker movement, you know what the maker movement is, right? Yeah. So, so 3D printing and local manufacturing and all that stuff. Um, and Internet of Things. There is no use of Internet of Things within the humanitarian world. I don't know why. I think I can see so many options, so many different uses of it, sensors um, in, within the humanitarian sector. But yeah, these, these are all... Um, things that are coming up. Thank you.
first, first of all, for your patience, because I went over like half an hour. Thank you so much. Yes, which is the 3D printing? The, um, yeah, we call additive man we, we call 3D printing uh, in, in academia additive manufacturing. So all manufacturing today is subtractive, I guess, right? You take a block of wood and carve out something, so there's a lot of waste. In additive manufacturing, you start with zero, nothing, and then you start layering it. So there's, min there's zero waste. Um, and which is 3D printing. So 3D printing technology is huge right now. I have a friend at Northwestern Engineering. He invented a new technique. Um, he only has one little pilot that he can show that his technique works. And HP already offered him $50 million for that. It's huge. You know, the idea is basically just like, you know, we all have printers at home. And you send me a PDF and I print it at home you will send me a file for, let's say, I'm, I'm missing the lid, right? I can't drink my coffee without the lid. You will say, Nezi, I have the file for it. You email it to me. I print the lid at home. Boom, we go. That's the idea. You have a question. In terms of uh, standardization for the intake coordination, uh, for example, in medical domain, we had WHO, right? Like yes. World Health Organization. Do we have anything for standardization of disaster management, or can we have? I understand about the political influence right. and all these things, but is there any organization trying to make it like? So every organization has its own standard, like the WHO. Yeah. And some organizations are big enough, like the World Food Program is the largest distributor of food in the world. They have standardization. But if I'm also, a, let's say, a Turkish agency or an American agency, that distributes food, like um, Southern Baptist. Southern Baptist Church is a huge organization in the United States that cooks for people. So Salvation Army and food banks would give them raw material. They will convert it to you know, cook dishes and distribute it. So Southern Baptist has its own standards. And their standards may not match with the World Food Program standards. That's the issue. Anything else? They're all like, it's, it's happy hour. All right, then. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.